Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. And on this week's podcast, number 180, I'm speaking with Ken Vehiki. Vehikite of Black Rock Knives. Uh, Ken is someone I've been following on Instagram for quite a long time. I'm really drawn to his style of super refined, apocalyptic, uh, is a, and you see a contradiction there already, but these these beautiful knives that are very refined, but also have a have a have a an ethos to them that makes you want to take them out and use them. And they also seem like uh, well, they they scratch my itch for beautifully designed and and uh, handmade weaponry. I'm just, I am gotta put it that way. Uh, so we are gonna get to Ken in just a moment, uh, but I do wanna say that if you value what we do here, uh, check out our Patreon and um, sign up there. You get a couple of things, and one of those things uh, is early release to interviews uh, like this one. So please check us out on Patreon. And uh, I am very happy to bring you Ken because I just received a knife from him. And so I am going to start perseverating in just a moment. So without further delay, I bring you Ken Vehikite. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you've got questions or comments, call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487. Ken, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Bob. Thanks for having me on. Oh, man, it's a pleasure. Uh, Your work caught my eye, I guess, probably right around the beginning of my involvement with Instagram, maybe Mm -hmm. four or five years ago. And uh, I only go on there. If you look at my feed, it is 100% knives. Now, I have a couple of bass guitar feeds in there, but it's it's pretty much all knives. And yeah. you were one of the guys I found early on, and uh, your work has resonated with me. It's, um, well, like I, I said in the intro, it's got a refinement to it and and an, a roughness to it that I really, really appreciate. And the roughness is not in the look, feel, or execution, but in the vibe. It's got a vibe, like a rough and tough vibe. And... Uh, well, I've just been a big fan of your of your work, and I, I had to get you on, especially since I received my very first Black Rock knives. Oh, this, yep, yeah, this monkey thumper, uh, Jim. I'm going to put this under the knife cam for a close up, uh, and then I, <laughs> and then I will let Ken talk. But first, I just have to, I just have to say, this is such such a fine and beautiful knife, and I've all I've shown it off for about a week now, and I've had plenty of people. Uh, both online and in the real, because I'm actually seeing actual people uh, comment on how amazing this thing is. Okay, so let me set this up by by telling you this, Ken. I, I work with a guy who is immense, and he's got giant hands. And I, every and he loves knives, and he's got a he's got a rough past. He's like the perfect knife buddy at work. And every time I get something new, I give it to him to put in his big mitts and see how he likes it. And this thing, he was giggly. He was he was crazy about this knife, giddy about it. And he even sliced himself pretty good on it, pulling it out of oh. the sheath. <laughs> and, yeah. I, and I, I almost I almost started to feel like, uh oh, that's his knife now. It tasted his blood. But yeah. um, but I just wanted to tell you that it, it's it's not only a knife that I'm just so super psyched about, but everyone I've shown it to has been extremely excited about it. So uh, I just I just wanted to get that out. Have you always have you always been a knife guy, Ken? Oh yeah, since uh, since I was a little kid, my dad gave me I think it was something like a Barlow style uh, slip joint when I was a little kid, and ever since then I've carried a knife. When I went to school, you could carry a knife to school at the time, so <laughs> I've carried knives my whole life, and uh, yeah, I really I've always loved knives. So I mean, what about it? Is that uh, what's the love? Where's the love come from? I don't know. It's a, uh, you know, it's just something, it's just like a real primal tool that you can, um, it's accessible to everybody, you know, it's I, from, I suppose like earliest man figured out how to cut stuff with Flint or whatever. And uh, I just kind of connect with that idea that it's a tool that I have with me all the time. So I, I, I think it. that, I think what you just brought up is what I was trying to say before I said rough vibe. That was really inaccurate. What you, what you just mentioned about, how it, you know, we talk about that on this show quite a bit, how it's the oldest tool around. And there is a, 
the with those grooves you put on the side and with this tooling you do on the on the spine, it actually has the vibe of a napped and and also that handle, it yeah. it, it it has the vibe creation you know uh, something something that has been napped like flint. Yeah, that's kind of the uh, idea. I, I like the idea. I think I guess you call it neo tribal, and uh, mm -hmm. it's just uh, that kind of a uh, old world look. Uh, something that looks like really, you know, like some like napped out of Flint kind of idea. Um, I, I didn't come up with that. I mean, there's other people who've who've done it, who've done it and who do it, but I really enjoy it. I like uh, I like guys who do uh, uh, forging but leave all the forge marks on the on the uh, on the flats. I like that kind of stuff a lot. So yeah, it just kind of uh, fits what what I like. That's why I do it. <laughs> yeah. I I remember. Uh and an exchange early on in my following uh, your work. Um, it was in the comment section of your, of your Instagram page. I must've been three or four years ago, four or five years ago, maybe even, but uh, someone said, Oh, you put those grooves on the side to hide the fact that you can't grind a straight uh, a bevel yeah. <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. What was your reaction to that? You know, I, I, I mean, you could do that I, if that's what you want to do, but uh, to be honest, I spend a lot of time on my uh, grinds and probably more time than I really need to, to make everything symmetric and uh, everything as as perfect as I can. And then I come in and throw the, uh, you know, that rock texture on it, uh, really just because I like it. You know, yeah. it's just something I like. So, you know, I, I, you know, if somebody wants to accuse me of that, that's fine. But I post a lot of times I'll post stuff before I put rock texture on there. Yeah. Just to kind of give ideas of, of what I can do without it. Right. So it's, you know, everybody's got their opinions, but <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm fine with that. Doesn't and they seem to let them flow freely on the internet. Uh, hold up that yeah. gator. You were, I think it was a gator. Yeah. Um, I, had a, I have a gator. just something I'm working on right now. Um, Gorgeous. So, that, but, so yeah. that, that looks a little different from, uh, I know your gator to be more of a, a clip point Bowie. This one looks a little different. It looks fully flat ground. Yeah, so when I when I name a knife, to be honest, the name is kind of surrounding the uh, the handle, and then I let I like to mix up different blade styles attached to what basically the gator handle. So when I say I've got a gator, uh, it could be you know a clip point, it could have a, a a fuller ground into it, it could be all kinds of different things. So, uh, but it's kind of. Uh, the handle really that's your refer when I say a gator or whatever style blade I've, I'm putting out there, it's kind of connected more to the handle. And then I like to use different blade styles. Okay, wait, uh, put that uh, back up, please. Uh, yeah. Something about the gator handle that I love is the pommel. To me, yeah. it looks like the perfect reverse grip pommel. I love the, I like to cap the yeah, thumb. The idea of that, sure. Yeah. yeah. And it also looks like even if you're riding further back, you could even hook it over the top of that. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe not. But, uh, but, yeah. but the, the, that's it looks like it's optimized for that grip. And uh, yeah, so maybe that's next on my list. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I have to get this. I have to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I can't spoil myself too much. But what, what is your... Um, everyone knows that's a lie. What is your favorite blade shape? I mean, you know you said like, cause I've never seen you do a sax. I don't think they all have these beautiful organic curves and I actually have done some, not very many. In fact, I'm working on one right now, a sax. So, um, excuse me. I, I don't know. I, I like a, a little bit of everything. I mean, I like a, a buoy style knife. It's probably, you know, the clip point, something like that kind of real traditional, but man, I, I, I like all kinds of things and that's part of my problem. I, I guess I'm a little, ADD on the, some of the stuff I do. I, I'll do a design and then I'll, I'll forget I even did it. You know, like it'll be, I'll come back to a picture. I'm like, oh man, I forgot I even did that. So uh, yeah, I like all kinds of things, but a big Bowie knife is always, it's kind of a favorite of mine, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Uh, I, I like that idea that you've made so many knives and so many different designs that you've, you can go back and rediscover them. Um, yeah. I, I'm sort of familiar with that concept. Just I've been doing art my whole life in various different forms and stuff. And you, if you're in a very um, you know prolific stage, you can look back. You, you know, you're constantly moving forward, and your old work is old work, and you see all the flaws, 
and you're always yeah. kind of reaching for that next thing. Uh, but it's great to rediscover stuff. Wow, I am talented. Look at that, man. I, like that. <laughs> no, I don't know about that, but yeah, I, I do like it. Uh, I like to, to rediscover some stuff that I forgot about. Yeah, that is kind of fun. Okay, so your dad gives you your first Barlow, and uh, it looks like you grew up in the 70s or 80s or something yeah, like that. Yeah, and, in the 80s, yeah. Okay, and you were allowed to carry a knife to school. That's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know where, if I was allowed, but I did. <laughs> no, right. They, yeah, and they weren't looking. Nobody cared. So where does it go from there? How, how does it how did flash forward to 2016, which is uh, when I know you became full-time uh, yeah. with Black Rock Knives. Uh, give me a little bit of an idea of that voyage from, you know, high school kid with a Barlow in his pocket to now. Yeah. So, uh, I've always been really artistic, um, uh, drawing and painting. Uh, when I was a, a kid, we had a guy in our local church that, uh, he was one of those, uh, frontier style reenactors. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he, we forged some, uh, throwing knives out of his place. And that really just struck me as the coolest thing ever. And, uh, I didn't make knives for, you know, years after that, but that always stuck with me. I, uh, I worked construction in my early, early years. And then I was in the custom motorcycle painting for a long time. Um, up until, well, I don't know, 20, uh, up until a couple of years ago, really. But I did that full time up until about 2008 when everything kind of tightened up. Uh, I was working in a prison uh, for, from like 07 to, around 2016. And during that time, in 2013, I started making my first knife. And uh, man, it just really, uh, from there, it just took off. You know, I, I was using real basic tools, files and and stuff like that. But um, so 2013, and then I just started making knives and people were interested. And then it just turned into a whole thing. And by 2016, I quit at the prison and I just went full time with uh, making Black Rock knives. Well, before we dive into your inspirations and stuff like that, what was it like working in a prison? Yeah, prison, man. That's a it's an interesting environment. Yeah, it's a, it's a maximum security play, uh, a prison, and uh, uh, it's one of those things where it's ninety nine percent boring, and then uh, you know one percent running around with your head on fire type of situation. So, uh, my main goal, my goal was not to work there very long, but I ended up working there probably nine years. And uh, it was really kind of the impetus to really kick me off into getting into knives and doing something else because I wanted to get out of get out of uh, working there. So it really kind of helped motivate me to, to figure something out. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, just the different way people motivate themselves to do things that are difficult, that that take real risk. You know, it's a real yeah. risk quitting a job and starting up. For sure. Yeah. It is. But but I've never heard anyone motivate themselves in the uh, to that extreme where you're like I'm going to put myself in a maximum security prison until I I <laughs> well, actually get the gumption. I don't know if that was my intent, you know. Uh, <laughs> when the market, <laughs> when when the economy fell apart, it was kind of tough to paint motorcycles. That whole oh, yeah. Orange County uh, uh, West Coast Choppers bubble kind of popped, and all that custom stuff went away. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still painted that whole time I was there, but it just wasn't a full time gig. Right. So. I had to, uh, you know, the prison was just a, a job I could pick up right away. And it was definitely motivation to, to figure something out and move forward. So, so what kind of, uh, I, I'm, uh, what, what, what kind of weapons, I'm not sure what kind of job you had there, but I mean, did you yeah. see any prison weapons, shivs, shanks, anything like oh, that? Yeah, yeah, man, they, those guys, it, it, if they're anything, they're, they're, they're smart. And maybe that intelligence comes from boredom, but you know, uh, you take anything that, is hard. I mean, a piece, a piece of plexiglass, an old screw, a chunk out of a coat hanger. I don't care what it is. Um, they can turn it into some kind of a sharp, pointy object, wrap a piece of old underwear around it and uh, use it to stick each other up if they want to. So, wow. yeah, I, I, yeah, you run into a lot of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Man, that, that just <laughs> sounds like a, well, that just sounds like a very extreme environment. And, uh, and 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 maybe good inspiration for for designing knives. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You definitely get some ideas off of guys in there. <laughs> yeah, they like to make shanks in there. So yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like you said, it's it's part boredom and part you know survival maybe or right, not survival, yeah. but uh, you know defense and that kind of thing. Right. Um, so once you start making knives, 
how did you decide on a process? You you mentioned that earlier on you experienced forging when mm -hmm. you were making the throwing knives with the reenactor. Um, did you think initially you were going to get into forging or how, how did you go about go taking it uh, to, to the level of production? Yeah, when I uh, first got into it, well, the idea was to forge. That was, uh, and I did do some of that. You know, I've got a forge and a couple forges and anvils and, and all that stuff. Uh, and that was the idea was to start with, with the forging. But um, the more I got into it, the more I looked at it, I figured, uh, um, number one, those guys that do that, man, that's a that's a hard road to make some money. Um, yeah. And those guys that, that, that spent, that's all they do. I really don't know how they make money doing it. I mean, it's just it's just like a level of time. Are you saying that? Okay. Yeah. That uh, I mean, I appreciate what they do for sure, but um, to me, I, I didn't see uh, it didn't work for me. So I just kind of went to uh, you know cut and grind um, the side of things, and that's uh, you know you can you can produce quite a bit that way, at least for me. And uh, that's kind of where I went, and it's just trial and error getting on the internet, YouTube videos, just seeing what people are doing and uh, asking questions and just trying things out. That's one thing I've never been afraid of doing is just trying stuff. Um, I don't have any problem fail with failing. Failing uh, uh, has been good to me in my life. <laughs> I, I tend to figure out good things through failures, so yeah. I, I don't have any issues trying things out. Man, that's a good attitude. So 5160, right? Is that the steel you use mostly or? I use a lot of 80 CRV. 80 uh, right CRV. Now. But so I use 5160, 1084, 1095. High carbon uh, steels. Yeah, high carbon usually, yeah. Okay, so so you're you're doing stock removal yeah, on stock removal. high carbon steel. Um, how do you heat treat? You said you have forges. Do you forge with a heat treat or do you use like a uh, an even heat oven? I'm, I've, I've always wondered about that um, dynamic. Yeah, I've got an even heat count. I use that. Um, uh, that's how I heat treat with even heat okay. and uh, oil quench. So, so how, you learned all this stuff on YouTube University. Do you have any mentors? Do you have anyone who showed you any any tips or tricks to get those lines so straight? Oh yeah, that's just all failure. <laughs> 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 you know, I got I got a boneyard of knives out there that you know things I've really messed up, and uh, I look back on some of my stuff. Uh, especially early on, and I'm just kind of embarrassed by it, really. But um, I wasn't charging much then either, so I mm -hmm. guess it kind of balances out. But yeah, most of that's just uh, a process of failure and uh, uh, just trying and trying and trying, and then kind of figuring out what works for me, and then going from there. Okay, so 2016 comes, and uh, you you become a full time knife maker. Describe yeah. describe what that was like. I mean, that must have been a little terrifying and incredibly exhilarating. Well, yeah. So, describe that process. Yeah. Some of the background here. I've got five kids. My wife and I got five kids. And in 2016, everybody was still home. I mean, they're just, they were pretty lit. Uh, between high school and elementary, I still had kids at home. So, um, yeah, that, that process. Uh, people have asked me about that starting your own business thing, and I really don't know what to say. There's no kind of magical uh, equation that makes it perfect timing. Um, it's just something you've got to kind of bear down and do. you got to weigh the pros and cons. I mean, health insurance and all that stuff, you know, it, that gets difficult real quick. Um, if, you, you know, it, all those aspects of having a full-time job, uh, some of the safety and comfort of having a full-time job is nice, but at the same time, if you're dying in a thing you're doing and you hate it, you got to make a move. So um, for me, I'm, I'd say my wife's probably more risk averse than I am. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm willing to try and do stuff, uh, but she supported me and I w I've been blessed, man. I've been blessed. I really feel like if you put your energy toward a good thing, that the tools and uh, materials and the ability to do that thing will come to you. I really believe that and that I've been blessed in many ways. Many pe people have helped me out. I'll just straight honest. Um, I, it's not 100%. I, I did every little thing. There's people that helped me out. And uh, those people are really important to me. And they sacrificed, you know, took a gamble on me. And 
you know, I try to I try to honor that sacrifice and and try to do good things with it. So, yeah, it's it's tough, um, but I enjoy it. You know, I do what I want to do when I want to do it, and uh, it's it's really tough. I'm a one man shop, so uh, getting things done can be difficult if you get sick or if you get hurt in some way. Then that that really slows things up. But uh, uh, ultimately, I enjoy it. It's what I want to do, and uh, I enjoy making things. I really get satisfaction out of creating things. So, um, and it's knives. I mean, I, the only other thing that I'd like to make would be something like guns or something. You know, yeah, I'm yeah. pretty basic. <laughs> <laughs> basic guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, I just had something that I wanted to ask you, and and it and it just slipped my mind as you were talking. But um, the 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 concept of not going for it. That's what I was going to talk about. Yeah. The concept of not going for it and thinking about, um, you know, okay, I'm not going to do it today. And I know that I'm not starting my business today. And it's yeah. easy to do that every day and mm -hmm. say, um, well, not to, I'll do it in, when this thing clears up or I'll do it when this quarter is over and work lightens up or whatever, whatever you're pushing it down the road. An interesting exercise to do is to think about, um, what it would be like if you stay in that soul crushing job um, or, or whatever that situation is for five more years, where will I be in five more years with this? You know, you do that with your bad habits and, and it can really shine a light on things. Um, and same, same thing with being in a, you know, in a job that has gotten toxic. And we've had a lot of knife makers on this show talk about how important um, their family or close friends have been in that, uh, in that, but especially wives. I mean, you hear that a lot. Yeah. If it weren't for my wife, I'd be a caveman. You know, I'd be, I'd yeah. be back in the, and I wouldn't be, I'd be in the prison and, and not, you know, I'd be working yeah. in the prison yeah. and I never would have made I, that. Move. I might be in prison actually. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You never know. Getting your three square meals a day. Oh, there you go. But, um, so, Let's let's talk about the designs of your knives and the different models. Where where I'll start off with my frame of reference, this monkey thumper. I'll put it under the knife kit. Yeah. Uh, what is your inspiration for for designs? This is a. I mean, I will note for everyone. I had I asked special request for that double edge. So this normally doesn't come double edge, but it's very much set up for it, right? Mm -hmm. What inspired this knife? Well, I'll tell you that. Uh, I like to draw, so I was just drawing different kinds of things. Um, I like a karambit, but sometimes that that hooked blade doesn't seem real useful to me. Mm -hmm. So I just, you know, took a a, a harpoon style, a shaped blade and put it on there. And uh, that this this blade's gone through like an evolution over time. It's it's looked a little different. Uh, I've changed the handle size a little bit, but yeah, I just kind of wanted to mix something kind of cool looking, but also useful, you know, uh, it's, you know, I'm not some kind of a uh, karambit master, so I can't say I, I know how to use a karambit, mm -hmm. but um, I like the design and the, just kind of the, uh, the whole aesthetic of it, but with a more useful blade on that, on that particular one. Well, since I'm lucky enough to have you right here, let me tell you some of the things that I've observed about this knife in particular yeah. and, and the handle. And it's interesting that you say that you, that you build your models around the handles. And this handle is, uh, what I notice about it is, um, I'm gonna, it, it looks upside down on, on camera, yeah, yeah. but I'm just in a weird position. But uh, I prefer in, um, in this forward grip or this uh, sort of saber grip, I yeah. like it without the ring. And the, I mean, you can put it in there. And if you do, you get, you get kind of a percussive thing going. You can, you can kind of cheat back on the handle. But when you grip it without the ring, you're left with this awesome pointy pommel that you can use as a noggin knocker or whatever yeah. you want. You know, uh, it's a useful percussion tool there, or pain compliance device or whatever. Because I I look at this primarily as a weapon. Obviously, I had the uh, I had the top edge sharpened. Mm -hmm. um, I love that aspect of it. I I love the fact that you and, and a number of people I've shown this to have mentioned it how you bring the G10 all the way around the ring um, because it makes the experience of holding the ring, especially if you're doing manipulations and you end up out here, mm -hmm. uh, very, very sure in hand because of the width of the uh, ring, 
it the width of the ring isn't just the tang it's also got these you know eighth inch uh, slabs on either side so it makes it very comfortable and thirdly yeah. Um, you know, I've done a little bit of karambit stuff in, in my martial arts training and such. And having this shape here is so ideal because you can, you can stop, you know, you can stop the knife as it's flipping this way. You can stop it sh in a very sure fashion with a, uh, with a totally circular ring. You'll be able to stop it with this middle finger, but it's going to have slop in there. With that <laughs> flat up here and that flat there coming together, there's no slop. It's a very tight kind of manipulation. So I think the design of this handle is is really outstanding. Plus it's very comfortable in my medium hands. And then like I said, my friend Marco at work has giant, you know, sausage mm -hmm. mitts in and it fits beautifully in his hand too. That's good. And he nearly lost a finger because <laughs> he <died. laughs> well, I hope yeah. Yeah. Gotta be careful sometimes. Yeah, well he he was he was really excited. Oh, <laughs> and okay. he and when he was drawing it, he had his finger right there. Yeah, man. People I, I try to warn people about doing that. But, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean I, I saw that when I got it, you know, I've I have enough knives and, yeah, and that yeah, kind of know. thing. I'm I'm used to it. And I didn't think to tell him, you know, oh man, be careful, don't get your because your finger naturally just wants to go in that spot. It's yeah. a nice yeah. a, a nice nook. Also, <laughs> I'm gonna keep talking. Uh yeah. The finish uh, on the blade is really um, okay. So you, you've, we've talked about the texture, we've talked about the grinds. Let's talk a little bit about the finish. What? How did you get that sort so of it's look? A, use a, it's a. I acid etch the blade. Okay. And if you know, yeah, uh, I'm drawing a blank here. But um, uh, anyways, I acid etch the blade, and it comes out pretty dark. Mm -hmm. And I throw it in a stone tumbler, and that's what gives it that. Uh, you know, stone wash look, I guess that's what you call it. So, um, yeah, that's basically the, 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 the finish on the blade. It, it, it seems to have it. It seems to have a, 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 a little bit of a sheen to it that I, I can't sure. quite put my, my finger on, but man, it is, it's, it's, I love it. And I love the G 10. I'm going back to the handles. I love the G 10 pins, by the way, and yeah. the, and the unique texture on each handle. Well, yeah, that, that's pretty much a fingerprint. You know, there's no two alike because, uh, they're going to come off, you know, I, I can't reproduce the same thing over and over. I mean, they look similar, but they're definitely going to be different. And, yeah. Well, so describe your process. Uh, uh, you, you walk into the shop. I know every day is probably different and you go through yeah. different phases of production, but what? Uh, tell me, kind of take me through uh, a knife from design to finish. Yeah. So if I have a, something new, I'll just draw it up and then uh, I'll usually cut it out of something. Uh, you know, a piece of old G10 or Kydex, just so I can feel it, generally feel what it, what it's like in the hand. Uh, because I feel like the handle, you know, that's the interface with the blade. So if the handle's not comfortable, then uh, it kind of, you know, it's kind of like uh, carrying a gun. If, if, it, if you're not comfortable carrying it, if a holster's no good, then you're not going to carry that thing. So, and I kind of feel the same way about a knife. If it doesn't feel good in your hand, then uh, generally you're, gonna, you're not going to use it. So, I'll cut it out of a piece of plastic and I'll, I'll manipulate it. I'll change it uh, a few times until I kind of figure out. And then I'll just uh, go uh, cut it out on a piece of steel, drill holes in it and grind it, heat treat it, put handles on it and see how it works. So, I mean, it's not nothing too fancy there. I mean, I don't know what kind of detail you want no. on that, but that's kind of basically it, man. It's pretty straightforward. So what uh, about testing? Do you, do you test them? Do you, um, when you make a new model, do you take them out and thrash on them? Yeah, so I, I do that a little bit. But what I'll usually do is I have like a scrap pieces of steel, like the test uh, edge retention, all that stuff. And I'll just grind like a real basic knife shape on it mm -hmm. so I can put an edge on it. And, uh, yeah, I've cut, you know, cut through brass rod and steel. Uh, uh, like a bigger blade, I like to chop stuff up with it. You know, like a big chopper, I'll go chop up old tree limbs and two by fours. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't spend like a huge amount of time uh, doing that. As long as I feel like I'm on track, I just kind of, you know, I always make sure it has a decent edge. You know, you can do like a, you roll the edge on a brass rod or something like that. Make sure it's not super chippy. Or if it's, uh, if it deforms, you want to make sure your, your heat treats good. So yeah, I try to do that, but I'm not like some guys spend a lot of time, you know, hacking and cutting on stuff. And, you know, I, I do that, but not, 
not on every single thing that I, that I make. So, right. Oh my God. Oh, stop right there for a second, Jim. <laughs> These knuckle duster knives are yeah. just, Oh my <laughs> God. So what are the, what are the unique challenges of making a knuckle duster knife? Yeah. Getting the, uh, the holes cut out in the handle. Um, that's a, that's a laborious process. Really. Um, you, you can drill out though. They're not, they're not a circle. They're kind of an ellipse shaped. So yeah, that, that particular, I'm going to be making more of those, but I'm actually going to have those water jetted because of the time it takes to cut out the, uh, the, uh, uh knuckle part. Okay. So, so how, how do you find out when, when you're going to be doing that? And I'm, that's a selfish question. <laughs> oh, well, I'm working on that right now. I hope to get that done here real soon. So, okay. um, it's really just, uh, getting those put into CAD and then having them cut. So. I mean, I'm I'm hoping within the next few months I can start having those more available. Yeah. Um, so as you saw, I mean, we saw a number of different blade shapes. We saw daggers. We saw that that broad dagger style, yeah. um, and 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 the kukri, gorgeous uh, blue yeah. handled kukri. But we saw something else there too. We saw the monkey thumper in um, production dress. Yeah. Tell me about that. You have two knives coming out with Fox knives. One of them is the the knife we've been talking about, the monkey thumper. Yeah. Tell me about it. Yeah. So I have with Fox knives, let's say uh, it was a 2019 blade show. Um, uh, they contacted me and we had a, we had a talk there at blade show in Atlanta mm -hmm. and uh, we did, settled on, uh, they would produce a monkey thumper and the other knife is a Ryu, which is kind of a Quaken style tactical blade. And uh, we got that going in 2019. You know, I guess these things take longer than I expected. I did hear it can take some time. You know, it's just logistics of getting things together. But then uh, COVID, I think, really kind of knocked them for a loop as far as being able to to uh, run full production. But they've got they've got them going. They're going to be available through uh, Fox Knives, and I think they're distribute through uh, like a Blade HQ and Knife Center. Uh, they're those, uh, as you can see, they don't have the texture on them, mm -hmm. uh, more of a clean design, uh, but they're going to have those two available here. Uh, I believe the Ryu at the end of January and the Monkey Thumper the mid-February time frame. So, yeah, that's coming up. So I do know one person who's going to buy that fox. Fox and I, the, the the dude who yeah. cut his finger, he's like, oh, I, yeah, yeah. he's like, tell the tell the man because I, I worked with him today. I'm like, I'm talking to the guy. He's like, tell that man I'll be his first uh, her, his first customer for the fox. And he's not a he's not a big knife buyer, but uh, there you go. Uh, yeah, we're all excited. So the process of doing that. Uh, so they invited you to a meeting. Right. So they, yeah, been, they contacted it, me. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so so how does that work? They license the design from you. You send them you send them drawings and they, they go from there. How does that work? Yeah. So basically it's kind of beneficial to both of us. They, they kind of use uh, my following base. I, at least this is how I interpret it. Mm. And uh, my name will be on it. And uh, they, they kind of use, uh, they do, I've seen, they've done this with other knife makers, but, uh, and if you go to the website, you can see they have uh, several knife uh, designers that they use. And it just kind of, uh, it's a way to, uh, for me, you know, I don't have any uh, material. I don't have any, you know, I'm not working on it. You know, they just, they use uh, the design and my name. And, uh, you know, I get a, a percentage of uh, uh, what they sell off of that. And uh, it's a really an experience for me. I've never done it. So this is kind of a learning process. And, uh, you know, like I said, I'm not afraid to try stuff. So I give it a shot and uh I'll learn from it and we'll maybe next time do something a little different, but that's kind of basically it, you know, from, from their point of view. I, I, it just occurs to me that as a, uh, well, as a really accomplished custom um, fixed blade knife maker with a, a, a wide variety of, of models, but even more importantly, you obviously have kind of a, a boundless imagination for this thing. You know, you lo look at for, for knife designing, you see all the different knives on your Instagram page. To me, you seem like a very marketable knife maker for production collaborations because, uh, you know, your knives are, are are really compelling to look at and they're fixed blades. And, and, and so that process for them is less expensive, I'm assuming. I, I don't know, so. yeah. uh, but I'm assuming. So yeah. it, it seems like, uh, like that could be a nice, uh, I don't know, man, that could be a great way 
for those out there who love your knives, but maybe don't have uh, uh, the, the wherewithal to, to buy a custom to go out there and get one, whether it's from Fox Knives or one of the many other uh, um, makers who, who collaborate with custom makers. Yeah, uh, I think it's one of the dirty little secrets of, uh, of uh, the kind of the more artistic maker world is that you, a guy can only make so much by himself. I mean, there's a limit to what, it, you know, I've tried to produce more in-house but I feel like my uh, quality drops and that's that's not a good place to get where you're just putting out junk. So um, I've backed off a little bit about how much I produce myself in order to keep uh, production up. But I think that dirty little secret is that if you don't figure out a way to leverage what you do into some other, you know, something like a collaboration with Fox Knives, uh, that it's going to be tough a tough go because you can only go so fast by yeah. yourself so right. you know it's just kind of and i don't know there's something i had planned out in, in my mind but it's something i understood so when the opportunity came i, I jumped on it you know yeah right. and fox knives makes makes amazing knives i've been uh, i've been going on and on about this uh yeah there you go uh, this is a jason knight uh L, um mk ultra right. that he had produced by fox and uh it is a really really sweet knife i have a couple other i think i have a i have a karambit and i think i have one other fox they make yeah. some odds and then i'm also uh lucky enough to have a fox knife prototype from uh you know it's a just a little slip yeah. joint beautiful little mm -hmm. slip joint from uh, mike latham and collector knives yeah. and the quality of this and this is just a prototype yeah yeah um the quality yeah. of this is amazing i i love their stuff and uh i i say this all the time but uh, you know my family is italian and so fox oh, knives they, you know they, they seem classy <laughs> to me but i don't know yeah, if i'm yeah. just uh, <laughs> i don't know if that's just me being uh, being biased so social media has done right by you i would imagine well, yeah. your, your instagram is i mean it seems like the best way to sell yeah. knives i mean because you can look at them right there if you're right. a you know so uh, yeah, I, I applaud that. So customer, feed actually, before I ask you about customer feedback, hold up that second uh, blade you had in front of you. Uh, people, look at this thing. Yeah, yeah. This, is a, this is the Reaver. This is, uh, uh, I think it's one you said, you know, kind of looks like a what, machete or smachete or whatever. Uh, a a smatch it. To me, yeah, it reminds me of that big, yeah. big broad. It's kind of, yeah. it's inspired by that a little bit, but it's not as wide as that, but right. yeah. And now this one's got a bayonet grind, and I've also seen them with the full uh, full back edge, right? Yeah, I've yeah. got some that they grind the, the blade all the way back. But yeah, this is just the idea of it kind of being used a multi-purpose tool. So that's kind of where that's at. Well, going back to what you were saying about designing the knife around the handle, can you hold that handle up, please? Yeah. Just want to take a look at that. So that is completely symmetrical, it looks like. Yeah, and see, that's a real pain in the butt. <laughs> uh, to do by hand, you know, uh, but yeah, it's uh, this is another blade. I stuff like daggers, I want to get water jetted just because the symmetrical issues that come into cutting them by hand is a real pain to try to, you know, if you mess up a little bit, then you're you know, you're just keep chipping away, yeah, until you're like, pretty much throw it away at some point. But it's like giving uh, a bad haircut, a little more right, on this side, yeah, a little yeah. more on that side. You gotta, you gotta be careful. So, yeah, symmetry is an issue with the dagger style blades, but. Yeah, this one's this one's okay. This will go out. So, so, so what is the benefit of? Uh, I, I know it looks beautiful, but what's the benefit of the symmetrical handle when you're when you're holding it in your hand? Oh well, this is just for me. I just wanted it to be a, just a big dagger. So okay. I make another dagger, almost the same blade. It's got more of a gator style handle, but uh -huh. I, I really just wanted this one to be kind of a, you know representative of a, 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 a kind of like a really short sword. And a really big dagger, so that's kind of where that that fell out. That's where that fell out with, the, with that shape. So, yeah. So, who are besides me? <laughs> who yeah. are buying your knives? And like, what kind of feedback do you get? And what kind of action do they see? I've had uh, quite a few military guys buy like the Gator. That seems mm -hmm. to be popular with the military guys. Uh, I mean, uh, guys, I you know. Special Forces guys tell me, I had one guy, a kind of cool story. He, he had a, I think it was a gator, and he took it somewhere in Africa, and he gave it to some chief, uh, some tribal chief, and that guy 
it was just something that really kind of uh, uh, kind of blew me away that there's somebody's uh, using that as maybe a way to communicate or to connect with somebody. And that, uh, you know, that chief really took that as a sign of honor that somebody gave him something like that. So, you know, that, that, that story kind of sticks out to me as something that I really like. I like the idea wow. that something I make can go out there and actually be useful to somebody. Yeah. That really you know, I connect with that. What's, what's kind of interesting about that is you were talking about uh, painting and drawing yeah. and, and, and even painting uh, motorcycles and stuff like that. Yeah. Those all have lasting power if, if yeah. they are taken care of greatly. I mean, to, to varying degrees, of course. A drawing on paper, you really have to take great care of to have it last. Sure. The thing about a knife, and, and I think this is one of the many things that capture uh, my imagination about a knife, is that they outlast us, and, and frequently by generations, you know. And so the thought that you're making these things, these knives that are not just uh, artful, but they are um, very, very useful, and then you're putting them out in the world. They're not only useful, they're not only artful, but they will last forever. Yeah. You know, G10 doesn't rot and steel, yeah. you know, steel eventually, if it's not taken care of, will rust. But sure. the point is these things will outlast you. And there's gotta be something rewarding about that too. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the that, that whole idea of a common heirloom type of thing that's passed down from from uh, father to son or father to daughter, I don't know, it's 2021, so we better include all that. But um, yeah, that the idea that it's passed down from generation to generation is, uh, I really, yeah, it really resonates with me. On, on it's that, funny on, you on. say that about the daughters because my daughters have already started a competition. Yeah. <laughs> I have two daughters, they love they love uh, knives I, because yeah. I just, you know, conditioned them in that yeah, way but yeah. every time i get a new one what do you think of this oh daddy you know they could tell i mean just by looking at this they could tell there was a it was a different level than what i you know i'm usually buying uh oh, commercial sure. commercial knives and folding knives and this kind of thing and they so yeah i'm gonna have to get two so that there's not a rift in the family i don't oh, want that to happen so yeah. <laughs> you gotta have some some girl knife junkies around too you know oh, i'm sure there are yeah <laughs> So um, do you have any um, designs coming up? I, I know that you, you just started the Gator. You showed the drop point Gator and the, but do you have anything that you haven't tried that you're kind of, um, kind of been mulling around in your head? <laughs> so I'm asking you to divulge secrets here. What do you have coming up in the future? What kind of new models do you want to try? Well, you know, I really, I'd like to get into folding knives. Um, there's kind of a whole level, a different level of uh, a tool tooling you need for that. But I think that that's something kind of a future goal, something I'm really interested in um, because, you know, I carry a folding knife every day, everywhere. So that's kind of uh, what really, really uh, seems more, most practical in like an everyday situation. So, yeah, I'd really like to get into folding knives. You know, I've got all kinds of designs that, that I might try. Uh, that I did put that kukri out here uh, in December. I definitely want to make a lot more of those, and uh, you know, just keep kind of tweaking and pushing and doing different things until I find. Because uh, unfortunately, if if I don't like it, I'm not going to do it. I, I mean, that's really what it comes down to. I've had people bring designs to me and say, "Hey, will you make this?" And I'm just honest. Say, well, if I just don't like it, I really don't want to do it. I mean, that's just how it has to be. So. Um, would, 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 do you make knives that people come to you with designs and say, can you do this? Is that something? I have a hmm. little bit. And I haven't done that a whole lot. I don't like doing it. I'll be yeah. honest. I, don't I, like I can imagine. It. I can yeah. imagine. It's like taking yeah. a commission. To, Will you draw my wife for me? Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Like I said, if, it, uh, I, if I don't enjoy it or don't like it, as far as making some design, I, I don't want to do it. Um, when I was painting motorcycles, I did that a lot where you'd paint something that was just so stupid and you're, you, you know, you almost don't want to put your name on it because uh, it's just so dumb. But, uh, you know, I, I, I just like to stick with what I like mainly. Yeah. I've, I've spoken with tattoo artists who say the same thing. It's just like, yeah. Oh man, you know, someone wanted me to write delicious on their butt and then yeah. the story. <laughs> and they only got the D out before the person was just like, ah, it's too painful. And they left. Yeah. So, so this guy, world-class tattoo guy yeah. has a D on someone's butt out there. So, right. Right. Um, the, uh, 
I would love to see what your uh, folder designs look like. We'll we'll all wait on tenter hooks for that. But um, does in your designs for um, folders, what part of the aesthetic of your fixed blades do you carry through to those? Well, I I definitely think uh, you know uh, the rock texture. I'd love to be able to translate that and um, into uh, a folding knife. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I've got some of my I've got some some of my fixed blade EDC style size knives mm -hmm. are really just folders that aren't made into folders yet. You know, I, I, I I've made them kind of with the idea that it could be made into a folder uh, pretty easily, and uh, you know, it kind of gives me time to spend some time with and feel it in the hand and, and kind of the size and the weight and all that. So yeah, there's a lot there's possibilities. Um, and uh, who knows what's what can come of that? But um, you know, it's something I'd definitely like to get into. It's funny you say that because uh, that was one of my first thoughts when I was looking, yeah. you know, examining it. I'm like, with this, I bet you could like it. Almost looks like you wouldn't, you know, you could put a hinge here. Like it looks right. like it would all fit. Obviously, you'd have to do a lot of different different yeah. things. So, uh, in going into making uh, folding knives, at is it the thing that you have to do as a knife maker or just, or is it the challenge? Uh, I know you said it's more practical and, and I understand that aspect of it, but in the making of it, I, I feel like some people feel it's their obligation as a knife maker to make folders at some point. But I also feel like a lot of knife makers are fueled by the challenge because, okay, I've, okay, fixed blades. I've gotten, I've gotten here. I know how to do this. What's next? Like what, creative challenge can I put in my way? And, 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 you know, a lot of people really like to start hard things and get good at hard things. And, and, it, you know, you've obviously started making fixed blade knives, which is a hard thing. And you've gotten to the point where you've mastered that. And now is this, is this another challenge for you? Is that uh, something? Yeah, that's definitely something I, you know, I, making a, a folder is, I just don't know much about it. So yeah, I, it's something it'd be fun to learn to do. And I definitely think it would be, there's some certain challenges involved in it. And uh, that's part of it. Yeah, I, I I get bored sometimes and I like to do something different, yeah. something that's going to be difficult and uh, that I'm not sure of. You know, that, that feeling of uh, doing something and then kind of discovering a new thing, that feeling is really good. And I like to chase that a lot. So um, I still have that even if I'm just grinding a knife, all of a sudden I'm grinding along and then I'll, somehow I'll just figure out how to make the plunges better or something. I'll just, it'll just happen. And man, I just, it's so satisfying to learn something new. Um, even though it's something I've done a thousand times or more, um, I'll, I'll pick something up new and I, I like that. So yeah, I think doing folders would be something, be a challenge for me and I'd like to do it uh, partly for that. Yeah. So creative spirit, does it run in your family? I saw that short film your daughter made um, maybe a year ago on your IG. I was actually trying to find that. couldn't find it, um, but I, I, I'm sure I just have to scroll, scroll, yeah, scroll. I but, pin that somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was, that was a really great short film about you and your knife making. Is this, is this something, is your creative instinct something that's kind of flowed throughout your family, your kids and such? Yeah, my kids definitely. Yeah, uh, my kids—they're uh, all fairly artistic. Uh, some really artistic, and uh, yeah, that's something that uh, um, I don't know that uh, I guess it's passed down. And uh, they really do enjoy making things and and experimenting in different ways. They've all got talents um, that that are that, that are real natural to them that way. Well, so what, what advice would you give to a, a young person, or not even young person, a young person in their knife building career or hobby, whether whether they're an older guy like me who's like noodling around and eventually when I retire, want to spend a lot more time doing that, yeah. or if it's the serious knife maker who wants to take that next step, what kind of advice do you have for them? Don't be afraid to break stuff. Don't be afraid to trash every piece of steel that you get. Um, something that somebody taught me when I was young is that uh, uh, you can't treat everything as precious. Yeah. You know, everything you make can't be precious. It can't be the most important thing. Um, a lot of things that you just use to learn and uh, 
if you throw them in the trash, you throw them in the trash. You, you just take what you learned from that thing and move forward. So, I mean, a lot of that is um, you just can't be afraid to uh, kind of drop the ball and make mistakes and uh, learn from them. And uh, especially in knife making, man, it's, it's grinding a knife is – you could say somebody could teach you how to do it, but man, you just got to lean on a grinder for a while until you figure it out. Cause how you do, it's going to be different than, you know, what somebody else does. So uh, there's a lot to learn on the internet. I mean, mm -hmm. there is a lot, it's crazy how much information you can get on the internet, but at the same time, uh, just putting your hands in on it, on a piece of steel. And uh, if you're forging, just go out there and beat on a piece of red hot steel until you get it to what you want, you know, um, and that's that's how you're gonna do it. That's how I. That's how you're gonna do anything. Yeah, you just gotta start doing it. Functionalize it. I mean, yeah, you can learn all day, and uh, you know, you see that a lot with martial arts. You know, people who yeah. watch videos and stuff, and it's important to watch those videos to keep skills that you've already learned in place. But it's very hard to learn something uh, from scratch <laughs> without actually doing the work. Right. You know, uh, so so learning it is one part, um, but. Uh, uh, don't be precious is, is a main, I went to art school, main tenant in art school. Yeah. You know, it's like, Oh yeah. You think that's a good drawing? It's not throw it away yeah. or, right. you know, throw it on the ground, start it another one, you know, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. What do you, it, yeah. Send it to the MoMA. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so how do people get behind the wheel of, of a, of a black rock knife? Uh, I, I contacted you on Instagram, but what's the yeah. best way uh, to reach out to you? Yeah, that's complicated, man. I, I don't have a website. Um, uh, and I know I've got a lot of patient customers. Uh, you're one of them. Um, yeah. it, it's uh, That is a logistical issue that I have yet to figure out. Um, uh, I guess you could almost say it's like I'm a little bit of a victim of my own success on that side of it, mm -hmm. is that um, I can take on more than I probably should. And um, working through uh, orders uh, is uh, can be pretty difficult. Here's here's something that I know people are frustrated with. They'll try to contact me through uh, Instagram or Facebook, mm -hmm. and um, I can spend all night just answering questions. I mean, I can you know I do what I do during the day, and then I can just sit down all night and just answer question after question. You know, I, and I've got a pile of people asking me questions right now. And I'd like to, you know, I try to take care of that. I'm not trying to ignore anybody. It's just uh, just the sheer, sometimes the sheer numbers can be uh, a little overwhelming for me. And uh, I don't want that to come off like some kind of a humble brag. I mean, that's not what I'm trying to do. It's just a fact. I just, I run into uh, time issues as far as that goes. And um, and I don't mind asking, answering questions. Um, but at the same time, uh I feel like a guy should kind of come educated a little bit on the front end. You know, if you're asking me what the difference between carbon steel and stainless oh, steel is. Tell him to listen to the Knife Junkie <laughs> podcast episode. There you go. <laughs> go. Go to the Knife Junkie podcast and go learn a little bit. And then we, you know, we can talk more, uh, more specific stuff instead of me answering, uh, you know, the difference between stainless and carbon steel. But I mean, I'll answer those questions, but man, that is, it's a kind of a time uh, eater to answer that kind of stuff. But yeah, I, it's, you know, send me a message. I'll do my best to get to it. You know, I hope this Fox knives thing can help people, uh, have a little more access to some, if the monkey thumper is a really popular design and, uh, this will be a, a, a cheaper version of what I make, not cheap as in quality, but it's just because they can mass produce. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's just going to cost less. And, uh, yeah, I hope that opens up some avenues and, and kind of gives some people different options as far as that goes. Well, two two things. One, uh, do you know if Fox is using their usual N690, which I I love that steel, but is that Neolox? Is that what they're yeah. using? Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. Neolox, yeah. And Neolox. then the other thing I was going to say. Oh, you said yeah, that's what they're using the yeah. The that's what they're, yeah. Okay. And, and I'm sorry, I just interrupted you, uh, no. but. I, you called me a patient customer and I would actually call myself an impatient customer uh, because I emailed you a couple of times. Where's my monkey temper? Yeah, you yeah. Know, and I'd see other ones going out. That one should be mine. Yeah, yeah. And, and and I do apologize for, for no, hounding you. Uh, I did. But uh, just so you know, it was, it's more about the excitement, you know, right. it's like, 
I, he said, I, or whatever, you know, and it's whatever. It's a month past the time you, I get it. Yeah. I, I get it. Uh, you got a lot of stuff going and you're a one man shop. Uh, I bought that monkey thumper out of a batch. You had just done yeah. a, um, a whole bunch of uh, cutting out a whole bunch of blanks, if you will, yeah. blade shapes. And you put it up and you said, who wants, you know, anyone want in on this? And I, I remember I was, um, picking, waiting for my daughter. I was picking my daughter up and I'm sitting in the car and I'm scrolling Instagram mm -hmm. and I get to that and I'm like, oh, I love seeing these shots before they're uh, completed. I wonder what this says. Oh my gosh. And, you know, I committed to it right then and there and mm -hmm. asked you if you can make a double edge. And, and for a custom knife, it, it, don't worry. It did not take much patience. I've heard horror stories about, you know, a, a year, two years, like, and I would imagine once you add the the mechanisms of a of a of a folder, it gets it gets complex. You can you can't commit to as many and and yeah. all those dynamics work in. But I I mean, I don't don't call you know, me being patient was that was nothing. I, I and and now that I have this thing in hand, I'm so excited. So well, excited. no, I really do appreciate it. I, I understand uh, that that uh, uh, you know people are patient. I really do appreciate that a, a great deal. And, uh, um, you know, I just feel, you know, I could improve my communication. That would probably be my best. That'd probably be the best thing I could do is just be a better communicator and, uh, helping people understand what's going on. I, I do have to say, well, like one thing is it's hard to get to comments. It's hard to, I mean, I've run into that sometimes, uh, too. Like it's, it's hard to get to comments when you're trying to shoot a video or it's hard to answer the difference between carbon steel and stainless steel when you're trying to make a knife, you know? Okay. So uh, yeah, communication can be hard when you don't have a social media team behind you, like yeah. answering these kind of questions. Yeah. So <laughs> I can see how that would help. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it could, it could. So, uh, I'm, I'm going to tell people to check you out on Instagram because it is the ultimate location because it's all visual and, yeah. and, I, you post regularly, and I love that. Like you can always see a, a black rock knife knife on, uh, you know, in any one of my scrolling sessions, I'll see something you've. Well, you know. I appreciate that. I feel like I have a responsibility to kind of keep uh, fairly regular on Instagram. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, people support me there, so hey, I, I really do appreciate all the support I get. It's kind of amazing when somebody asks me what I do, and I tell them I'm a knife maker. Uh, their face. I could see the confusion in their face. They, they can't even <laughs> register what that means. <laughs> I don't even understand. <laughs> yeah, they don't even understand what that means. So, you know, I, I am truly blessed to be able to do this. I, I love it. And, uh, you know, I, I'm glad there are people like you who, who, who enjoy what I make. And, uh, you know, that's something that's that's a big reward on my on, for me is just that somebody likes something or uses something that I, that I make. So I do appreciate that, Bob, man. I really do. Thank you. Well, Ken, thank you uh, for this beautiful knife. And thank you for coming on the knife junkie podcast. Ve uh, Ken Vehikite yeah. of black rock knives. I appreciate your time, sir. And I really appreciate your work. And uh, I will, I'm on the hook from, well, I'm not on the hook yet, but I will put myself <laughs> on the hook for more. And okay. I think I know what it's going to be. And we'll talk afterward. <laughs> All right, man. Okay. Thank, you. thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast, sir. Thank you. That's been a pleasure. Take care. Do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR13MOV and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie. Probably worse. <laughs> Probably worse. Terry Rounds, I miss you, brother. Uh, our good friend Terry read those liners. Don't be precious, man. If I mean, he said a lot of great things, but if I if I if I have to remind myself of something uh, over and over and over is in whatever you're doing, don't be too precious with it. You know, like if if someone criticizes your work or if you're making something and it's not turning out right, psh, just move on. Well, it was great to talk to Ken of Black Rock Knives. Uh, uh, it's rare that I have the chance to uh, speak to a knife maker, especially a custom knife maker, because I don't have many custom knives. But right after receiving one of their uh, one of their knives, and really get to geek out with them, and it was great to uh, great to have the video of Ken making knives that I saw a year ago. But then to talk to him and really find out, um, you know, what's behind them. I urge you uh, check out Black underscore Rock 
underscore knives on Instagram. Check out his beautiful, beautiful work. And uh, well, I'll be showing this off for the next few weeks, I'm sure, uh, ad nauseum. And uh, and then uh, I will move on to the next Black Rock Knife. So for Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, saying don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.